You guys got really quiet, and I wasn't quite set up yet. You should have kept talking. All right, now I'm set up. There we go. How are you guys doing? Good? Sweet. Uh, if you are new today, uh, maybe you're watching online for the first time, or you're new uh, here in person, I want to say welcome. Uh, my name is Lawrence LaFollette. I'm one of the pastors uh, on staff here at Western Reserve. I'd love to get to know you a little bit, shake your hand um, after service. So I'll probably be in the lobby area in the back. Um, so I'd love to uh, at least get your name. And uh, yeah, excited that you're here uh, to worship God with us today. Today we're going to be returning to our series uh, going through the Epistle of James uh, called Evidence. Uh, evidence. Now, if you've been with us for uh, the past nine, ten weeks or so, um, we've been working through uh, the epistle of James, and this theme of evidence continues to come up. And, and the idea behind it uh, that James is trying to communicate uh, to us is, as believers, as followers of Jesus, if we make that claim, we make that statement that that, that is who we are, then our life should be different. Um, the way we live, the way we interact with people, the way we are uh, in his church, there's just something different about us. Um, it's, it's an identity thing, and it's an outpouring of that identity. Who we are uh, changes when we are followers of Jesus. And so the challenge that James has for us is uh, if, if you claim to have faith, if you claim to, uh, to love Jesus and be a follower of him, uh, well, do more than just claim it, right? Show me your faith. Show me uh, through your behavior. Show me the evidence uh, of your faith and of your walk. And so he, he goes uh, through all these different chapters, going uh, piece by piece through our lives, saying, hey, in this area of your life, whether it be uh, trials in your life, whether it be uh, temptations in your life, whether it be uh, the use of, of your tongue in your life, uh, all these different categories, uh, is there evidence of your relationship with Jesus? Uh, and so, so we've been challenged, I believe, as a church in, in a lot of different ways. And uh, today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be moving into, into the next uh, big category of thought for James. But uh, instead of it being, hey, this is what your life should look like, instead, James takes a different approach. Remember, he's speaking to a very specific audience. They have very specific uh, sin issues, things they're struggling with. Uh, and so as he launches into this, instead of it being, this is what your life should look like, he's saying, hey, church, hey, people, hey, followers of Jesus, this is something that you're doing wrong. And so in instead of the tone being uh, in more inviting and, hey, I'm challenging you to, to do this differently, instead it's, hey, uh, believers, uh, there's, there's judgment for this sin in your life. But before we get into that, I want to, uh, we're going to be in James chapter 5. You guys can turn there if you're not there already. Uh, before we get too much into that, I want to rewind uh, to the end of chapter 4, something that we talked about uh, last time we were in James, and kind of get a running start into our passage, because a lot of the themes uh, from the end of James 4 feed into uh, James chapter 5. Uh, you can throw that up on the screen. And this is, again, familiar if you've been working uh, with us through uh, this evidence series. But, but James starts out and he says, Now listen, you who say. When, when you see something like, now listen, and then he targets a specific group of people, it's an audience shift. right? Instead of talking generically to people, he's talking to a specific group. And here, the specific group he's talking to is the ones who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or to that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. And he says, why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead of saying these things, right, what you ought to say is, if it is the Lord's will, we will live 
and do this or that. Now, I don't want to re-preach the sermon uh, from back then, but I want to point out uh, several key things. When, when he targets this group and says, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money, uh, this is a specific class of people that he's targeting. This is the, the merchant class. These are the people who are, uh, for all intents and purposes, trying to, to get rich quick. Um, they're at least trying to be successful. They don't have uh, a lot of wealth by themselves. They're trying to find their way. They're trying to make their way. And in the process, they begin to make plans. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go to this town. We're going to have this business model. We're going to do this. And hopefully we can be successful if we make all of these pieces fit together. We make our plans. We've got to execute our plans. And maybe we can get rich quick. Maybe we can make a living if we do it right. And what James confronts them with is, hey, guys, this life, your successes, they are fleeting. You're trying to make all these plans. You're trying to, to uh, prevent uh, losing money, and you're trying to strategize and figure all this out. And what you've done, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is you've forgotten God in the process. You've neglected him in your get-rich-quick get strategizing. And so in, in forgetting him, you're forgetting this key line. If it's the Lord's will that this should happen, then it will happen. In other words, don't strategize, don't plan absent of God. It's not that plans are bad. It's that as you're making these plans, the one you need to be walking this life through with is your Lord. Because what he says goes. He is the one who's in control. So walk through life with him. Now go to our passage in James chapter 5, verse 1. Notice the beginning here. Now listen. When we see this, just like in the past, he's targeting a specific audience, a specific group of people. He says, now listen, not merchant class, not you know, blue-collar kind of workers. It's now listen, you rich people. Now, this category uh, of, of person, they are, they are ones who tried to get rich quick, and uh, they were successful, whether that was something that they did in their own life or maybe they inherited their wealth, but they are landowners, they are business owners, they have established wealth, but it's not going anywhere. So he says, you rich people, and here's the big idea that's going to govern a lot of what we talk about uh, for the rest of our time today. He says, now listen, you rich people, Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. If any of you are wondering why Jason thought this was the week to go on vacation, <laughs> this is why. Um, it's, just, it's just a great one today. Very excited about it. But if anything goes wrong, he's not here so we can blame him. Okay? And yeah, I hope, hope Hawaii does him well. All right, so now listen, you rich people, weep and wail uh, because of the misery that is coming on you. Now, this idea of weeping and wailing, this is, this is deep grief, deep remorse over a tragedy. And wailing is the way in which you express this weeping. It's the degree in which you express it. It's not just you know, kind of pouting to yourself. It's crying out. It's wailing because of the misery that is coming on you. This idea of misery is uh, calamity, is devastation, specifically for those who have come under judgment. In other words, what James is addressing with these specific people and their riches and in their wealth is they have used and abused that power. And because of that, there is judgment 
headed their way. Now, a couple disclaimers as we get started here. Uh, it's very easy when we're studying God's Word and something like wealth comes up, riches comes up. Uh, it's, it's very easy for us to slip into, oh man, riches are terrible, right? Money is just a bad thing. It's, it's bad to be successful. It's bad to be, right, because there's, there's all this judgment coming. But truthfully, when you look at, at the context of even this passage, but as well as, as the rest of Scripture, the wealth is not the issue. The wealth is not the issue. Instead, it's the heart of the wealthy. That's the issue. Instead of uh, the, the wealth being bad and the wealth being sinful, instead it's the misuse of your wealth, the unjust use of your wealth. It's a misplaced relationship with your money and with your things to where those possessions end up taking the place in your heart and where God should be. Instead of allowing him and, and walking through life with him, that theme that he began a few weeks ago, instead of walking with him through your life and, and with your wealth, instead you have closed off your heart, you've become callous to it, and you say, you know what, my wealth is more important, so if I have to steal my way, be unjust in the way I use my wealth so I can keep it, so that I can maybe get more of it. Well, that's where the judgment begins to come in. And so James, in, in the verses that follow, gives several warnings, as well as judgments, for earthly wealth and this misuse and this bad relationship that we have a tendency uh, to move towards with it. And the first uh, the first big point is earthly wealth is temporary. Earthly wealth is temporary. Look at James uh, chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. It says, Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. So this rotting, this corroding, this decay of our temporary wealth, our misplaced relationship, not with the eternal, not with our God who never changes, who is always with us, but with this money, this wealth, these possessions that can go away real quick. How many of you uh, have heard of maybe the best toy in all of childhood uh, called a rescue hero? Does anyone know what the, these things are? Back, okay, well, my wife, but that doesn't count. <laughs> a rescue hero? Oh, this is so sad. All of you are so deprived. It's okay. Um, a rescue hero, something that I loved growing up. Uh, unfortunately, they discontinued them, so maybe they weren't the best. But either way, uh, I loved rescue heroes. And rescue heroes were uh, the, the superhero of first responders. Okay? They had a little TV show that kind of went along with it, some movies as well. Uh, but these rescue heroes, if there was you know, a volcano, if there was a, um, an earthquake, if there was major flooding, and first responders weren't quite getting the job done, you would call in the superhero of first responders, these rescue heroes, and they would come in and they would save the day. And so they had these pretty, pretty hefty uh, action figures that went along with it, and my parents knew that I loved these things, and so uh, they had a bunch of different accessories, like big old robots. You could place them inside, and you could remote control operate them. Um, they had uh, remote control cars that you could put on them and, and move them around, and these things were awesome. But as with the rest of life, uh, eventually you get to a point where you outgrow your toys, and you have to to pack them away. And uh, for sure, as I was playing with them, and even now when I look back at, at these toys that I had, it was, 
I was wealthy. I was rich. I had these amazing things, these amazing possessions. Well, as I was packing them away, putting them in boxes, and they were going to be my keepsakes that I was going to cherish forever and, and maybe give to my kids someday, uh, I remember my dad uh, telling me as I was packing them away, he was like, hey, uh, have you taken the batteries out of these things? I was like, uh, well, no. What if I want to pull them out sometime and want to use these, these toys or I want to show people because they're, like, they're cool? Um, and what he had to explain to me is, well, if you don't take the batteries out, you see batteries eventually begin to decay. Eventually, they'll begin to corrode uh, in, inside of your toy. And instead of this being a nice keepsake, something that you've stored away, instead your rescue heroes are going to end up being ruined. So you have to take those batteries out. Take away those things that are going to decay. Take away the corrosion, because if you keep the, the corrosion in there, well, it's going to end up ruining it. Well, the same thing James is saying here, if you could throw those verses back up on the screen. He says, your wealth has rotted, moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded. They're temporary, they're, they're fleeting, they're, they're wasting away. They're not eternal things. They're not lasting things. And their corrosion, just like those batteries, they will testify against you. Eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. The interesting thing here is that he uses gold and silver and talks about their corrosion. If you don't know anything about uh, metals and, and precious stones and things in that nature, uh, you'll know that gold and silver do not corrode. Like, scientifically, they do not corrode. But James is saying even these precious metals that, that don't corrode because they are temporary, because they are not lasting, because they are not eternal, they, for all intents and purposes, they corrode. They're not good long term. They're not going to save you. It's temporary pleasure. If we look over to Proverbs, chapter 23, we see a, a proverb along these same lines with riches. It says, do not wear yourself out trying to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. They're fleeting. They're temporary. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. If you place um, your, your heart, your relationship in your wealth and something temporary, eventually it's going to be gone. Eventually it's going to let you down. The challenge is, what is your relationship? What is your use of your wealth? Is it proper <laughs> Or are you placing too much emphasis, too much of your heart on something that will go away? So earthly wealth is temporary, but earthly wealth, and we see this in the next phase here, earthly wealth is also corrupting. Now this is, again, these are generalized statements. This is not the case in every situation, but it definitely is here uh, with James. Look with me at James chapter 5. Verse 3, he says, uh, your gold and your silver are corroded. We just talked about that. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. You have hoarded it. The temporary has, has become all you crave, all you desire, all you want. In fact, you begin to need it. The more you have, the more you need. I feel like now is a good time to talk about the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> because I love the Lord of the Rings, and illustrations from the movie are pretty good, and I always have Sam Spivey to back me up afterwards. So anyway, if you have seen the Lord of the Rings, um, or maybe you've seen the, the lesser trilogy of the two, uh, you've seen The Hobbit, maybe, 
Uh, within these movies, uh, you have several different races of like humanoid creatures. Okay, you have regular humans, and then you have orcs, and you have elves, and you have dwarves, and you have wizards, and a bunch of different types of people. And in the Hobbit uh, trilogy, the the main well, I guess the main race you could say is a hobbit, but actually it's not. Um, one of the main races that you're working with throughout the films are the dwarves. Now, the dwarves are known in these movies for being uh, very wealthy. They are the miners um, digging into the mountain, trying to find wealth, finding precious stones, uh, precious metals, becoming very wealthy, very prestigious. And something that these, this, this book and, and these movies begins to confront is for these, for these dwarves, they begin to get more wealth, they begin to, to acquire more, and as they do that, they begin to, to get what's called in the movies uh, dragon fever or, or gold fever, where they begin to see it, they begin to crave it, desire it, and then their relationships with other people their relationships with the other nations, the relationship with their family, it begins to collide. There begins to be this, this tension because all they want is more. All they want to do is hoard their wealth, to bring it in. And everyone else getting in the way of their wealth, well, they're just, just cast them aside. We don't need people. We need the money. We need to be able to walk in our halls full of gold, full of jewels. They begin to be known for their greed. One of the main characters in the film, uh, some of the, the character arc that you can begin to experience is uh, he, he starts to, to fall prey to this gold fever, beginning to cast his companions aside, and, and all he wants is, is craving a precious gem. And within this character arc, part of the story is him overcoming this gold fever, overcoming this desire to hoard wealth, and realizing the importance of one another, the importance of companionship. Good movie, go see it. This comes up again in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It says, Whoever loves money never has enough. You always want more. Not because the money is bad, but notice it doesn't say that. It says whoever loves money. It's that relationship that's wrong, that relationship that's sinful. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Always needing more, always craving more. And this, too, is meaningless. Always wanting the next best thing. I'm reminded of the American dream. We all know what this is. But the American dream of, of wanting to have that, that nice house, those specific vehicles, those cars, having the family, the dog, the, the, the fence in the backyard. We, we want all these specific possessions and we want to make it to achieve the American dream. There was a study done, I believe this was this past year, and it surveyed a bunch of um, Americans in different financial brackets. Um, some were millionaires, some uh, were barely scraping by. And then doing this survey, they began to ask different questions um, along the lines of, you know, what do you think, if you could guess, what do you think the average annual income is globally? So not, not speaking nationally here in the U.S., but globally, what do you think the average annual income is? And, and people began to calculate in their minds, and they're like, well, I make X, and so, you know, I know that there are billionaires in the world. I know there are plenty of people that make tons and tons of money. But I also know at the same time that there are people who don't make anything. 
just scraps. And so how does that end up averaging down? How does that, that balance out? And so they began to say, you know what? On average for this survey, for this study, it came out that, that they believe the, the annual income per um, adult throughout the globe is probably somewhere around $20,000 in obviously our, our currency, but, but that value, about $20,000. When in reality, not $20,000, but when you take the globe and you take global wealth, you, you average it down to what everybody makes, it's really more towards 2000 $2,000 a year that people make on average. You take that, you measure it up against our American standards of, of wealth, and we think, man, I'm, I'm only making, let's say, you know, $40,000. I'm only making $50,000. I'm, I'm, you know, maybe I'm only making twenty. I must be super poor. But even at $20,000, it's 10 times what the average person makes across our globe. And, and I don't mean that in any shameful way. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with being well off. But sometimes it's good to have that reality check moment where we realize, man, God's blessed us with so much. When I'm chasing more, when I'm chasing the next big paycheck, the next big opportunity, am I doing it, walking with the Lord, so that I can utilize it and leverage it for his glory and for his kingdom? Or is this wealth that I'm, I'm trying to achieve for myself, is it because I have misplaced contentment in my life? I'm not content with what the Lord's given me. I'm not content even in my relationship with him. I need, I need something more. This temporary thing that we know eventually will be fleeting. It's a challenge for us, a challenge in our thinking. James continues, he says, you know, earthly wealth, it's temporary. Earthly wealth, it's corrupting. And finally, he says the earthly wealth is condemning. And now here he takes a step outside of uh, just the, the track that he's been running so far, and he sets up a scene. And I'm glad that he does this, because then I don't have to think of an illustration. He does it for me. But he sets up this scene of, of a courtroom, and he asks you to imagine it. Imagine this, this courtroom, and, and you have the wealthy standing trial. They're standing up there. They are the, the defendants in this case. James says, I'm going to be the prosecutor. I'm going to come at you with accusations, with these claims, with these truths. And this is before God is the judge. We're abiding by his laws. And then we get to be sitting alongside as the jury. Now, we don't get to, to deal out Punishment, obviously, but we can certainly see and agree with the prosecutor, yes, this is wrong. That They are guilty of this. Okay, so he sets up this trial. He sets up um, this, this trial of the wealthy, if you will, and he begins to launch accusations. And the first one, for, for these wealthy people, the specific audience he's writing to, they have misused their wealth, they have misplaced their relationship with money, he says, first off, first accusation, you are cheap and you are unfair. What do you mean by that? You are cheap, you are unfair. Look with me at James 5, 4. He says, look, we're beginning this trial, look at these things. The wages you failed to pay your workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvest have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have not been a faithful employer. You are cheap. You are unfair. What are you doing? In 1 Timothy 
chapter 5, verse 18, Paul says this, he says, For the scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out grain. The worker deserves its wages. This, that last piece, the worker deserves his wages, that's something that, that we can understand pretty clearly. But maybe this first piece we don't. Uh, he says, Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out grain. The idea here is that these, these owners have, have their oxen, right? They're treading out grain. They're on the threshing floor. And they would muzzle the ox because the ox, as it's working, it's working hard, it's threshing this grain. Sometimes it would lean down and take a bite. It would eat some food. It would have some energy. But you know that if the, the ox is doing this as it's, as it's on the threshing floor, well, you might lose some money because they're eating your profit. But according to Scripture, the ox deserves not to be muzzled. Don't, don't close its mouth. Don't, don't stop it from eating. Allow it to eat. It's working for you. Allow it to be healthy. Pay it what it deserves. Allow it what it deserves. But these rich people that, that James is accusing, they're not doing that. They're not paying who they should be paying. They're, not, um, they're being unfair in ways that they should not be. So they're cheap, they're unfair, and we see the second accusation. You're cheap, you're unfair, also you are self-indulgent. Fancy word, we'll look at it in a second. If you go to James chapter 5, verse 5 says, You have lived on earth in luxury, and you've lived on earth in self indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. Again, this is Jason's fault. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, sort of. Anyway, <laughs> so you've lived on earth. In luxury, you've lived on earth, self-indulgent, you've fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. Uh, truthfully, it speaks uh, for itself. I think another passage that maybe brings us out even harder uh, comes in, in Philippians 3, um, or at least it helps describe what self-indulgence really is. It says, For I uh, have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, uh, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And these enemies, right, of, of the cross, these enemies of Christ, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. This whole idea of their God being their stomach is, is they have these cravings. These desires, these, these hungers for the things of this world. And they want to satisfy that hunger. They want to satisfy um, that, that desire within them. And they become self-focused, self-indulgent. That, that same word picture of, of eating, of consuming for your stomach's sake, for your pleasure's sake. In other words, you're addicted to pleasure. You're addicted to your stomach, what you can indulge yourself in, what you can consume, not, not just literally, but also figuratively. So maybe it manifests in, in food, maybe it manifests in, um, in, in possessions, maybe it manifests in you name it. Gratifying your flesh, gratifying your desires, gratifying your stomach, because it, it tastes good, it feels good, it helps me. So he says, you know, accusation number one, you're cheap, you're unfair. Two, you are self-indulgent. Then he gets into his third accusation, you are murderous. Look with me at verse six. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Now this this condemnation, this murder of others is a mentality of, of trampling everyone under your feet. 
You have money, you have power, and above all, you have an objective. Those who get in your way are casualties of your own ambition. And so murderous, this is a a theme that came up earlier in James chapter 4. We can look at that real quick. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Now, I, I think this certainly has literal meaning, and, and that's maybe hard for us to, to understand. I think of the story of King David in his self-indulgence and his desire for pleasure brings, on, brings in a woman who's not his wife gratifies his pleasure, gratifies his flesh, and in order to cover it up, he has her husband killed. Now, is that an extreme example? Is that not something that we necessarily do today? Well, maybe. But if we were left to our own devices, if we were left to our own hearts, is that what we would do? All of this, James is trying to get our attention. He's trying to get our attention and have us think. What in our lives, what possession, what riches, what pleasures, broaden that out. What earthly thing has captivated your heart? And do you realize that that thing, whatever it may be, is not going to be with you for all of eternity? Your possessions are fleeting. Your money is fleeting. Your lust is fleeting. All the things that you could could think through, like, my heart is chasing this. It's fleeting. So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to to rely on? What are we supposed to hold close to our heart? What are we supposed to treasure? In Matthew chapter 6, I think we see a really good summary of James' thoughts. And of his heart. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, we see this Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. These treasures that that are temporary, these treasures that that can corrupt you, can condemn you. Don't store up for yourselves these treasures where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. And here's the challenge. If you've located these things in your heart, you say, this is not what the Lord desires for me to treasure. He says, this is what you should do. This is what you should treasure. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, There, your heart will be also. I had the KJV in my head, so I was trying to course correct midway through that. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think spiritual treasure should be uh, defined as broadly as possible. Spiritual treasure is is everything that a believer uh, can take with them beyond the grave. That's holiness of character, obedience to God and his commands, souls won for Christ, disciples nurtured and challenged in the faith. In this context, specifically, I believe that storing up treasures is focused specifically on um, the use of uh, the compassionate use of material resources to meet others' physical and spiritual needs. In other words, rather than than viewing your your finances, rather than viewing your 
uh, the desires of your heart as something that can be craved for yourself. The idea is, look outward. What are eternal ways that you can use those resources? What are eternal ways that you can store up treasure in heaven? A relationship with a fellow believer. A relationship with someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, that isn't following Christ, that you can share your faith with. You're not going to take that nice car to heaven someday. But you will get to be with someone that you were able to lead to the Lord. There are a lot of different ways that you can take that. But what I really want for all of us, what I want to challenge us in, is, is to place yourself on trial. Place yourself on trial the way that James did with these, these wealthy people that have, have misused their resources. And ask yourself a couple of things, very simply. But where is your heart? Is your heart in, in the things of this world? Or is your heart in, in quote-unquote, heavenly, eternal things? Do you desire the next paycheck more than you desire that coworker that doesn't know the Lord? Where is your heart? Because where your heart is, there is your treasure also. I don't know if I quoted the NIV or the ESV or a blend of the two there, but it's okay. Where your heart is, there is your treasure also. So where is your heart? Is it on the right things? Are you using your resources and, and walking through this life with the Lord, recognizing, as, as James brought us into this conversation, recognizing that if it's the Lord's will, we will even continue in that wealth, continue in those resources? Are you walking through your life with him in mind? Is your heart there? Maybe second, ask yourself this, where are your blind spots? This is your, if, if any of you have this on your vehicle, it's pretty nice. I thought it was annoying at first, but it's actually pretty nice. Uh, you know those blind spot detectors on your cars? Little orange flashing light, sometimes it beeps at you if you turn on your signal too early. Um, I remember getting in, in Emily's car for the very first time and doing that. I was like, why is this thing beeping at me? Because I've always driven clunkers, which is fun. But anyway, I remember turning that thing on and uh, hearing that beep. I was like, what in the world is that? And she's like, oh, no, no, it's, it's that blind spot detector. The little orange flashing light is telling you, hey, there's something that you're not seeing, something right next to you that, if you're not careful, can really alter your future. <laughs> that was probably not the greatest metaphor. That's okay. But ask yourself, what, what are your blind spots? I think there could be a good mix of people in the room. Maybe you're someone who, you hear this sermon and you're like, man, I've been doing this wrong. I need to, to course correct. This is a challenge for me. I haven't been, been living out my, my Christian life through my finances the way God's called me to. Maybe you're on the other side of the fence, the other extreme. Maybe you uh, are, are thinking about um, your, your finances and you're like, oh, I'm so glad God has changed my heart. I'm so glad that he's, he's worked on me and I'm in this position where, where he's using me and he's using my wealth and I'm walking through life with him. And, and this is just an encouragement today that, that God is still moving in my life and it's working. Maybe that's where you are. But I think for most of us, if I can speak for myself and project onto you, no, I'm joking. Uh, anyway, but maybe for some of us, we have our wealth, we have our resources, 
And we're giving and we're doing this, walking this life right. But maybe we have blind spots, areas where where we need to look in the mirror. Maybe God's calling you specifically to use your wealth, to use your savings, to use your, you kind of fill in the blank with your situation to impact his kingdom. And you maybe haven't thought about that before. You haven't evaluated what the blind spots might be. You've signed up online for for giving and you've just kind of forgotten altogether what the active side of being generous, the active side of, of giving, of using what God's given you. What might be in your blind spots? What might be that flashing orange light that you need to take a look at? So where is your heart? Where are your blind spots? Finally, where is your treasure? Where your heart is, there is your treasure also. I think I've quoted that differently each time I've said it. But the principle there, when you evaluate yourself, your your finances, your, um, your life, your heart, your passions. Where are you looking and saying, I desire to place my treasure there? Um, Emily and I, on our very first date, um, it was a blind date, and uh, she has infamously called it the interview date. Um, <laughs> Because we, we went into it, and I was kind of under the impression that I wasn't going to mess around anymore. That I wanted to find someone that was, that was serious. That, that actually wanted to love the Lord and, and live for Him with their lives. And so the very first question I asked her, blind date, we didn't know each other. We maybe exchanged names and bought coffee. And uh, sat down with her, and I said, all right, Emily. Tell me what your passions are in life. And I think I scared her a little bit. But what I wanted to know was, you know, Emily, where, where do you see your treasure? What are you pursuing? Is, you know, riches, success, that perfect career? We are, in fact, in college, right? Is that your greatest treasure? Is that what you're searching for? Is that what you're longing for? Or do you see treasure elsewhere? Heavenly treasure, a desire to follow him, to use your gifts, to use your finances for him. Thankfully, she had the right answer, and I've never looked back. (laughs) So put yourself on trial today. Where is your heart? Where are your blind spots? And where is your treasure? Are you leveraging what God has given you and using it for him. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to worship you, to sing to you, but also to look at your word in, in depth and understand what you have for us. I pray that, that everyone in this room will, will continue evaluating Uh, themselves, evaluating what you have given them. and God, I pray that we will pursue you as our ultimate treasure. I pray that those words, well done, my good and faithful servant, that that will be our heart cry in this life. That we will pursue you with everything we have. Thank you, God. Your name, amen.